What's up, YouTube? It's Josh Pilot, the RuneScape Felon, and I've got a goodie for you today. So in the past, I've talked about famous inmates that I was locked up with, and I've mentioned one a few times. Uh, Clarence Heatley, the Black Hand of Death, also known as the Preacher. Uh, he was a very, very famous high-profile inmate that had an insane story. Uh, and I actually did quite a significant amount of time with him, relatively speaking. He was at Talladega, which is where I did most of my time at. And uh, today, we're going to talk a little bit about him, because this is going to be Inmates That I Knew Part 2. And uh, I had no idea that this dude's story was so crazy, but we're delving right into it. We're going to talk about Clarence Heatley. Harlem's homegrown menace. I haven't even filmed this yet, and this is by far the most time, effort, and research that I have ever put into a video. But this story is nuts. So get ready for an interesting blend for YouTube. It's a true crime style story where I tell this guy's exploits, but turns out he was a pretty good friend of mine as far as prison goes. But we'll get to it. It's a little bit different because this is somebody that I'm very... I'm personally involved with. This isn't something from a distance. This is a guy that I ate with, a guy that I talked with, a guy that has been mentioned in my Tales from the Jungle before. And um, he had a crazy story. Clarence Heatley was born in 1953, which means he was in his early 60s whenever I met him, and he'd been in prison <laughs> since 96 or so. Uh, some of you are going to ask why this big, famous, multi murderer, uh, drug dealing criminal doing such a absolutely insane amount of time why he's at a security level that I was at a medium he's been locked up since 1996 as you will find out through the story over time uh, with good behavior your security level goes down because there's a point system based on age crime etc uh, risk factor of the future even education is included in it and mine is the re that's why I went to a medium and was only a few points away from going to a high security thank god I didn't because I probably would have got killed just for how I look or something but he had managed to work his way down from penitentiaries and I think this was his first medium security prison but I'm not positive but that's why he was there in the first place because as you'll see this guy was a very serious criminal and it seems like it would be strange that uh the runescape prison guy was at the same prison as him clarence Heatley was a self-proclaimed fourth grade dropout uh who began his criminal record at the age of nine when he was sent to a juvenile detention center but um with a long string of criminal history leading through the 1970s the important part for our story begins in 1983 this is the beginning of the crack epidemic um, so just so you guys know, that's about the time that everybody, I guess, realized, if I'm not mistaken, the CIA was involved in it. And that, I don't think that's a conspiracy theory. I think the real Rick Ross, not the rapper, was like taught how to make it by the CIA or something. Maybe that'll be a different video. But anyways, he got invested in the crack business, all right? He started making a lot of crack. He started buying up tons of cocaine. And he started making a whole lot of money because he got in on the game early. And because of these deals that he knew about and him being involved in the game so long he soon was a key part of the entire drug infrastructure which meant that he had information about other people's drug deals and where they were making their purchases which means he soon moved into extortion where he was also fabulously successful when he branches into extortion is where things get interesting and evil this is when somebody that i just know is my friend clarence became the evil maniac that has TV shows and DVDs and movies made about him for his exploits during the late 80s and early 90s. So there's a reasonable amount of information that pertains to this case, uh, that way more than I'm going to be covering in this video. Uh, like, way, way more. There's so many facets of this story, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cover what I feel like is the important part. I'm going to tell you an extortion story uh, about the kind of thing they did as confirmed by his son, um, and I'm also going to talk about one of the most famous, infamous things that happened with him and his crew and what ultimately led to their downfall. The reason there's so much information is because of total cooperation by Clarence and his co-defendant John Cuff to avoid the death penalty after arrest, which obviously we're going to get to. This was also followed by an extensive interview done by Preacher's son, Shaka Heatley, with the now defunct BlackGangsterDVD.com. In this interview, a great number of terrible crimes were described in great detail, but today I'll just keep it down to the story by Shaka, like I mentioned, um, a very famous incident and a very infamous incident. Let's keep it small here today. Some of the things that I'm going to talk about were not confirmed in a court of law. He had a very funny phrase about that, as you will see, that he told me himself with his own mouth. Um, but we will be talking about largely things that were confirmed in a court of law. Before we get started, over 98% of the people that were raided and arrested by the FBI today were not subscribed to Josh Pilot on YouTube. 
It, it could be a coincidence. I don't know. If you're trying to keep Uncle Sam off your roof, trying to keep Uncle Sam out your poinsettias, uh, statistically, it's not going to hurt your chances. You might as well just click subscribe. And while you're down there, go ahead and give the video a thumbs up. I spent a really long time on this one. I've got fat picture folders, video clips. You guys just might as well go ahead and show it a little love. Let's get back into it. So an example of the extortion that they branched into after their success of the crack business, uh, Shaka explained in depth in that DVD that I mentioned earlier. And he told, for example, a story of an extortion wherein, okay... He has his girl call a guy that owns a business, right? He called it a fish and chip joint, which I think is very strange. That could be a New York thing, but I've never heard an American say a fish and chip joint, even though they have a different accent and everything than where I'm from. I guess that could be a local thing. But anyways, he says in the example story was a fish and chip joint. And they had a girl call the guy because the fish and chip joint is mostly a money laundering scheme. The guy that owned it was actually a drug dealer. So she calls and she says, hey, you know, Billy, I'm going to come down there at 3 o'clock p.m. And I'm going to pick up, you know, $20,000 worth of illicit substance. So he says, cool. And he hangs up, right? Well, this girl, with the cooperation of many, many people, takes $100 bills, cuts newspaper into the sizes of $100 bills, and makes fake stacks of hundreds with one on top and one on bottom and fills a bag up. It's only a few hundred dollars, but it looks like tens of thousands, right? And she goes down to his shop with this bag. And as soon as she walks into the store, what do you know? She gets robbed. Two young men are standing around in the store, see her, see this bag of money, immediately pull out weapons, rob her for the money, and leave, right? Well, how do they know that the business owner didn't set them up? That's what they claim. My girl got robbed in your store. I lost my money when she came to do a deal with you at your establishment. You owe me money. That's just one example of the type of extortion that they went into. And these people would end up paying significant, substantial sums of money for protection from a gang that was just constantly threatening them. Using extortion schemes like this and setting up payment plans through a multitude of similar extortion schemes involving dozens of people that were all in on the job in some Truman Show type clusterfuck of a fake crime that was a real crime being committed. Uh, it's estimated that he was possibly extorting anywhere from 5 to 10 people a day for amounts ranging from $2,000 to $10,000 a pop. It's a lot of money. Now, before we really get into the deep, gritty story, we're going to go ahead and get the unconfirmed one out of the way, even though it was a little bit later, because uh, this is the thing that I asked him about in person, which I mentioned to you guys earlier, all right? Uh, one of the most notable things that Clarence was accused of doing was kidnapping famed musician Bobby Brown in 1993 regarding an unpaid drug debt. Here's the crazy part. Clarence and the Preacher crew are not the people that Bobby Brown owed the money to, nor are they the people that gave him the drugs in the first place. It was actually an associate of Clarence who was the dealer that gave Bobby Brown about $25,000 worth of crack on the front, on the credit, whatever you want to call it, because he knew he'd be able to pay him back. But months later, Bobby still had not been able to be tracked down. He was having great success in the music industry and was very much unreachable in the day of not having cell phones and social media. So Clarence said, hey, you know what? I'm going to do you a favor. I'll buy his debt. So Clarence paid the $25,000 to his friend, to his associate, and said, I own that debt now. And with Clarence being in control of that debt, it was going to be worth a lot more than $25,000. The preacher crew kidnapped Bobby Brown, bringing him to a basement that we will eventually circle back to probably a few times, a basement where I can only imagine that nothing good on this planet has ever taken place. Famed singer Whitney Houston, Bobby Brown's wife at the time, was contacted by one of Clarence's top lieutenants, either John Cuff, a then active police officer for the NYPD and the right-hand man of Clarence, or Anthony Boatwright, an ex-military man who specialized in weapons and trained the preacher crew in the ways of war. For example, informing them that double-tapping the enemy in the head to confirm a kill is the only way to operate and to assure success. John Cuff was a police officer, and Anthony Boatwright may have been schizophrenic, as he was known to have perfectly normal conversations with individuals, and then as soon as they turned their head, he would shoot them in the back of the head because he perceived some disrespect or threat in what they were saying that nobody else picked up on. It's also possible, of course, that he was just psychopathic like that, because you'll find out that they found a few of those guys. But we'll, we'll get back to John Cuff and Anthony Boatwright, but for now, as well as their power struggle. But right now, Whitney Houston's on the phone with a group of Harlem's most notorious and violent drug lords, being told that she has to pay a lot more than that $25,000 debt to get him back. 
and she knew they weren't playing around. Whitney Houston ended up paying in cash the ransomed man that Preacher asked for, totaling at $400,000. This story was widely reported on by the media and was never technically confirmed, I would like to say, nor denied by Bobby Brown in Whitney Houston's camps at all. Rest in peace to Whitney Houston. She was hands down one of the greatest singers of our time, and she obviously loved Bobby very, very much. So now, that's the thing that I asked him about. Because I didn't know who Clarence was when I arrived at Talladega. His story was originally whispered to me by other inmates, the younger ones like me, with relatively short sentences. And I found out pretty early on, going into my sentence, that uh, he'd been locked up since I was a small child, and that he was never going home. And uh, I do clearly remember one day where he was uh, actually featured on an episode of Gangland, with the same picture that I've shown you here in this video. And uh, he actually just walked to his cell and closed the door and covered it up with a towel while his face was on TV a few yards away telling the story of how he kidnapped Bobby Brown and that Whitney Houston paid him the ransom. But uh, since I was on good terms with him, I had hundreds of friendly and casual conversations with this guy. I did ask him point blank if he kidnapped Bobby Brown <laughs> and Whitney Houston paid the ransom. And I will never forget what he told me, but after my research, I guess it seems like he didn't necessarily take this to heart. But what he told me was, Son, never admit to anything that hasn't already been proven in a court of law. So on to the most infamous part of his story that actually was proven in a court of law. Though his degree of involvement is debated, and as you can expect, he denies much of the blame for this next fiasco. Though his son has also confirmed in the long-form interview that I mentioned earlier that his father was very unhappy with this and how it played out and that he'd expressly instructed his people to hold back this one time. But old habits die hard and many lives were ruined and lost because of this extortion attempt gone wrong. Now we're going to go back to a time even before Bobby Brown's kidnapping. We're going back to 1989. The Preacher crew was at peak performance. Their extortion schemes were incredibly successful, and they had invested each scam into dirt-cheap drugs that they would soon be shipping into New York Harbor. The aforementioned John Cuff was an active housing cop who drove Preacher everywhere, which instantly deflected any police presence on the scene, and he openly carried weapons to protect Preacher, acting as both a shield and an escort, and some say a sometimes assassin, which is not hard to believe, as we'll get to. But Cuff wanted to be the official lieutenant of Clarence. At this time, before the military man Anthony Boatwright, there was another character vying for control. He was trying to climb the ranks, and his name was Malik. It seems that no pictures of Malik exist on the internet, not that I could find, but if nobody did take pictures of him while he was alive, it's too late now, so I mean, whatever. But Malik was a vicious murderer whose bloodthirst was so reckless and insatiable that even his associates believed that he was completely insane. Malik was in charge of the janitors, which was a crew within a crew, comprised only of confirmed murderers within their group. The janitor's job, as expected, was to clean up evidence at crime scenes and dispose of bodies by any means necessary. Morbidly, each of these janitors had a mop and bucket tattooed on his upper arm with blood gushing down the handle and filling up the bucket. Malik was in charge of the janitors, and they had operated so smoothly and efficiently that it ended up taking 13 years for the FBI to finally catch up to Preacher. John Cuff was his protection from law enforcement and his most trusted advisor, and both of them wanted control. It is also worth noting that it seems from my research that John Cuff was not a cop turned criminal, but he was a criminal intentionally turned cop. This might have been planned years earlier by Preacher. They seem to have gone back for a long time, and uh, this might have been a very, very old scheme set up years in advance uh, for protection against New York City's police officers, which, of course, it did work. Uh, John and Clarence had a long history together confirmed. Malik had merely climbed the ranks from a drug dealer to basically the most trusted of the assassins. But as I said, it's 1989. The crew is rich, they're unstoppable, and the police can't even get a description of the preacher. A close friend of Clarence's named Johnny Porter also known as Apple, which I will call him from now on, had been watching his own nephew rise through the ranks of Harlem's drug dealers, acquiring substantial wealth and power beneath the wave of cheap drugs that Clarence was shipping into New York. Now, because Clarence and his lieutenants had been dealing drugs, as I mentioned earlier, particularly crack, for so long, they always had their ear to the ground. They would track down drug dealers and extort them, they were taking cuts of several thousand, maybe even tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands a week from their extortions, um, and continued selling drugs to the public with no issue. But Apple's nephew was rising through these ranks. Apple's nephew was already paying excessive extortion fees to Clarence and still was making a substantial income. The nephew's name is Richie Porter, and he is incredibly important from here on out. This young man, Richie, 
was a major success, even with his extortion payments, like I said. And Apple, as his uncle, was very close to him, at least as far as interactions go, if not necessarily feeling. And Apple was keenly keeping track of Richie Porter's business endeavors and his movements and his investments. And he was trying to slowly convince himself that his little nephew was actually making millions of dollars a week selling drugs. It's also possible that Apple might have been jealous. I've heard that a lot uh, because Richie Porter was a very strongly connected local and he was a very positively accepted local guy. Uh, Like I found tons of pictures of Richie on like jet skis and like with nice cars and stuff and like all kinds of different people. Like it seems like everybody loved him or something like that. Uh, But I didn't really find hardly any pictures of Apple. So that probably, that probably speaks for itself. Nonetheless, Apple told Clarence that he wasn't charging Richie enough on his extortion fees, claiming that Richie was making millions a week, which even stopped Clarence in his tracks. After conferring with his lieutenants, Malik, the bloodthirsty psychopath, devised a scheme to extort half a million dollars from Richie, money that Richie simply didn't have. Malik informed the preacher crew that Richie Porter's 12-year-old little brother, Donnell Porter, walked to school every morning by himself, and that he would have absolutely no problem being able to scoop him up throw him into a van, and bring him back to the notorious basement until some ransom money could be delivered. According to Preacher himself and his son, Clarence expressly forbade the crew from killing the young boy, but agreed to set up Apple's own nephews for half a million dollars. The kidnapping went off without a hitch. Just as Malik promised, he discreetly kidnapped 12-year-old Donnell on his way to school on December 5th, 1989. Donnell was brought to the basement to be held hostage, as John and Malik repeatedly called Richie's household. After finally getting in touch with the young boy's family, he demanded $500,000 for the safe return of Donnell. This sum was outrageous, of course, but Richie Porter responded that he only had $250,000 available and that it would take him weeks to save up $500,000. Again confirmed by both Preacher and his son, according to them, Preacher was willing to accept the quarter million dollars. He was apparently willing to take the $250,000 in exchange for Donnell and call it quits, call it a dub, and just trust that, you know, Richie wasn't going to let the boys snitch or anything and just end it there. But Apple and Malik insisted that Richie was lying. They said that he had the money. If he didn't have it on him, he could get it. And they absolutely must not budge on this price tag of $500,000. And for some reason, Preacher relented and agreed with them. Richie was told to get the money together. And at some point, Donnell's mother asked Preacher how they even knew that Donnell was still alive. The crew instructed Richie, to look under the sink in a McDonald's located at the corner of West 125th Street and Broadway. Yes, this is an actual picture of the actual McDonald's and a picture of the street sign. Underneath the sink, someone had taped a paper cup and inside the cup, police discovered one of Donnell Porter's small fingers along with a tape recording of him crying and telling his mother that they had cut his finger off and he didn't know what to do. With this gruesome proof that Donnell was still alive finally obtained, Rich Porter frantically began a weeks-long effort to scrape up another quarter million dollars to purchase his brother's freedom. He began to hustle and deal harder than he ever had before with the help of his close friend and long-term business partner, Alpo Martinez. Alpo was born in Spanish Harlem in 1966, began selling drugs when he was 13, and had risen to power alongside both Rich Porter and their other associate, drug dealer and extortionist A.Z. Faison. This particularly notorious trio would engage in such legendary amounts of mischief that a feature-length major film was based on their exploits, the 2002 film Paid in Full, which itself was followed up with a DVD explaining the ties between real life and the fictional film, which was called Game Over. I mean, we're dealing with absolutely legendary criminals here. These guys were very well known in the Bronx Bronx and Harlem, uh, and Rich was hustling as hard as he possibly could trying to get this money together, and Donnell was actually kept alive. For now, weeks passed as Alpo tried to help Rich scrape up the money. Donnell was kept alive in the basement for the time, and Rich was almost ready to come forward with the full $500,000. And just before the meeting was scheduled to take place and the ransom to finally be paid off, the preacher crew got a little bit of news that shook them to the core. In Rich's desperation to save his little brother's life, he had overextended himself, and he owed his close friend and partner, Alpo Martinez, a substantial sum of money. Money that Alpo knew Rich had because he'd been helping him earn it and save it to free Donnell. With Rich's outstanding debt in his mind and absolutely no concern for the safety or well-being of Donnell, Alpo Martinez murdered Rich Porter on January 3rd, 1990 
almost one month to the day after 12-year-old Donnell Porter was kidnapped. This posed a problem for the preacher crew. Rich's mother was a known addict who lived in poverty, and getting $500,000 out of her was basically the same thing as asking her for a trillion. They now had a wounded child hostage. The FBI was looking for them harder than ever before and trying to figure out who had the kid, and there were, was absolutely no chance that anyone was going to be paying for this child's freedom. Clarence, as leader of the crew, claims that he ordered the boy to be released to his mother, saying that they would cut their losses and allow him to go free. But unfortunately for Clarence, and Donnell, and Donnell's family, the person who was sent to execute these orders was no less than the sociopathic leader of the janitors, Malik. Malik decided that because the boy had seen each of their faces and heard their names during the last month of incarceration with them, there was no way that it was safe or logical for him to be released. Without Rich at home as a sort of safety net against Donnell testifying to the police, Malik made the decision to murder 12-year-old Donnell Porter. Without Clarence's permission or apparent even knowledge, Malik killed the boy, cut him into small pieces, spread him into many bags, and spread the bags across New York City in hopes of avoiding detection. Needless to say, Clarence soon found out that Malik had directly disobeyed him, and he had murdered the child. The crew had grown increasingly concerned and shocked at Malik's bloodthirsty nature, but this was a level that had finally gone too far. The weapon was now beyond their control, and Malik had become much more of a liability than he was an asset. As was their custom, the crew all told Malik that they would be going down to the basement to murder a different associate of theirs. Then once he was in the room, they shot him in the head. This standard protocol of murdering one of their own was followed very closely with Malik, but because of the relief of finally being rid of this psychopath, a special ceremony was given. The preacher crew destroyed his body to erase evidence of his janitor tattoo on his arm, but took his severed head to the rooftop to play soccer with it. As confirmed by multiple FBI agents, the preacher and his son, all themselves. Before we continue, I think it's worth noting what happened with Alpo Martinez. It's kind of directly, indirectly his fault that uh, the money wasn't paid and that Donnell was murdered. So Alpo ended up uh, murdering Rich Porter. He was convicted of it. He also got brought down on 13 other murders. And uh, this is probably going to surprise absolutely no one considering what he did to his best friend. But Alpo snitched. Alpo snitched on everybody and everything. Alpo rolled over so hard that he would have won a gold medal in the Olympics for gymnastics because he just immediately rolled. I mean, he flopped and he got a 35-year sentence even with substantial cooperation and snitching. And according to all, uh, the internet says he served that time at the ADX Ultra Maximum Security in Florence, Colorado, which I, I've heard horror stories and I know people that have been there and, and it makes my skin crawl. It's the, like the Ultra Max or Super Max or whatever you want to call it. Uh, like the entrance is miles underground tunnel. Like it, it's wild, okay? It's it's. There's no human contact there whatsoever. And apparently he did about 35 years there. Apparently he was released in 2015. He entered the witness protection program, took a fake name, and began focusing on one of his life's original loves, which was motorcycles. The call to Harlem was apparently a little bit too strong for him, however. And Alpo began to be seen driving his motorcycle dangerously through his old neighborhoods, all around his old stomping grounds. This past Halloween, October 31st of 2021, Alpo Martinez was murdered in cold blood during a road rage incident over how fast he was driving his motorcycle through residential neighborhoods. After all that, after all that, everybody was all like, he finally, he finally got got. Nope. Nope. It, the, the crew didn't take him out 35 years later or whatever. It was road rage. Gangster, bro. Good riddance. So obviously the FBI really wants the crew now. And uh, around this time, a new task force was created by the FBI. And this task force was known as the C-11 crew. Uh, apparently, that doesn't have any super amazing meaning behind it. Um, this officer that we'll get to in a minute says that it just stands for C as in crime, and it was the 11th unit created. But anyway, these guys were fully dedicated around the clock to tracking down Clarence and his cronies. But as the new decade rolled in and the 80s became the 90s, they were having trouble even getting a description of the legendary Black Hand of Death. The no-snitching law was in full effect in the Bronx and Harlem in this time, as seen by this upstanding young individual who clearly had never witnessed any wrongdoing in his neighborhood when asked about the dealings of the criminals. Those who said they'd heard of Heatley didn't want to talk. I live right there, across the street. I haven't heard anything about drugs. So while they were quite certain that there was an FBI task force looking for them, uh, Clarence and his friends were staying immune from local law enforcement, due to the ongoing presence of the crooked housing cop, John Cuff. And it was said that Cuff once had a shift partner completely come up missing while they were out on the beat together, and apparently his body was never recovered, and no one was ever charged. 
Uh, but I think we can draw some conclusions here. It was also around this time that the aforementioned ex-military man Anthony Boatwright joined the crew, and he brought a deadly precision with military tactics to this increasingly professional criminal gang. The janitors were still so efficient at getting rid of the bodies that there was no trail at all leading to Preacher or his friends. There were only street rumors that the C-11 crew thirsted for, with a few descriptions of Preacher saying that he was six and a half feet tall. Um, I find that interesting. Uh, I'm going to, I guess, comment on that. He's nowhere near six and a half feet tall. Now, listen, he's he was in his 60s when I met him, right? And he was he was hunched over, and he had one of the federal prison-issued walkers now. Um, I don't think he had a stroke. I'm not sure exactly what it was. He kind of has a little bit of a limp now. But even it, he was at several inches shorter than me, even acknowledging the stoop that he has now, a little bit of a hunch. Uh, there's no possible way that he was six and a half feet tall. I'm not sure exactly what that is in, you know, the rest of the world that all, you know, has more standardized height measurements, um, but he was not nearly that tall. I will say this, he was one of the stockiest people I've ever met, and if he was messing around with it, he'd say, you see this right here? You see this thing right here? Look at that thing right there. That's a meat cleaver. You see this thing, eh? And and I'm talking about this dude's fist was like this wide. <laughs> he had the widest fist, and he was just stocky. He was like a little bull, man. I mean, even at, his, at the age of 60, it was definitely obvious that he was a very large powerful man in his youth I, I but six and a half feet tall is a little bit of a stretch here i can see maybe why they thought that based on his general proportions because he's a big dude but he's definitely not he wasn't i can't imagine him being six and a half feet tall even standing up straight from that walker that he uses now sometime in the early 1990s the c11 task force did manage to arrest a crew member on some minor charges and he was presumably going to snitch on clarence and his associates the snitch actually was in a courthouse possibly cooperating with authorities, and unaware that Clarence and his four friends were waiting in the van outside for him to emerge. The snitch climbed into his car, noticed Clarence in the passenger seat of a van, and instantly veered his car the wrong way down a one-way street to try and avoid capture by the thugs. Uh, the van actually turned and followed him without hesitation up the wrong way in a one-way street, uh, police all came pouring out of the courthouse, uh, and according to one officer, there were an estimated 30 officers in fast pursuit of this van that had Clarence and his cronies inside of it chasing after this possible snitch. Uh, but they did catch up to them, and Clarence and his friends were actually arrested on site. And in the van, they found several lead pipes, four masks, a roll of duct tape, and several lengths of nylon rope. So that kind of speaks for itself, but... Despite the obvious circumstantial evidence here, these objects don't prove anything themselves. Clarence actually beat the case because the snitch suddenly forgot everything he ever knew about this so-called preacher. The ultimate result of the entire fiasco was that by the time of the Bobby Brown kidnapping, Clarence was fully aware that a special team had been formed to capture him, and he was growing more paranoid by the day. Eventually, the C-11 crew managed to obtain legitimate information that a hit had been placed on John Cuff's life. Following FBI protocol, Special Agent Joe Walsh was required by duty to inform the corrupt police officer that his life was wanted. And I'll throw this picture up here of Joe Walsh right here. I don't know why they felt it was necessary to put Special Agent on the screen with this guy. I mean, this is quite obviously a police officer. This is the most obvious police officer looking ass dude that I've ever seen in my entire life. This guy was born snitching. He looks like he crawled out of the womb and immediately snitched on the doctor for giving his mom an extra tramadol like for the birth pains. Like this is obviously a cop. So I don't know why they felt the need to put that on the screen. But anyways, so Special Agent Joe Walsh approached John Cuff to inform him that there was a hit out on his life. And much to his surprise, not really to my surprise because you would at least know the guy's a cop, uh, Cuff recognized the officer. He didn't just know he was a cop. He knew his name. He knew he was Special Agent Joe Walsh with the FBI and probably knew about the C-11 task force too. He called him by name, laughed at what he told him and said, everybody wants me dead. By 1995, FBI agent Jay Marr had begun to piece together a massive web of crimes, almost conspiracy-like in their connection and in their vastness. The crimes that Marr connected stretched to almost every single street corner of the Bronx and Harlem and involved almost every serious or capital crime known to man. Word was placed on the street that any member of the Preacher crew underneath Preacher or his two lieutenants would be given full immunity from prosecution in exchange for testimony. The FBI wanted Preacher, Cuff, and Boatwright so badly that they were willing to free every single person beneath them in this operation from punishment, provided that they would give them enough to prosecute with. In 1996, the C-11 crew arrested a heroin addict on a federal gun charge. This addict was a known member of the inner circle of the Preacher crew, and after what I assume was minimal pressure from the FBI, he cooperated with them. Everybody in this story snitching. And the information received from this snitch 
is what finally led to the arrest of Clarence and his cronies, as they were finally able to definitively pin down a double homicide that traced back directly to the Preacher crew. More than 10 years after the first investigations against them began for this entire operation, Clarence and his friends were finally in custody about a month after the snitch gave testimony. But here's the kicker. The best part of the confirmation of the double homicide that was committed by the preacher and his crew was that it directly plugged in to FBI Special Agent J. Mars conspiracy web that detailed one of the most heinous crime sprees in the history of America. Like, he, everybody thinking the conspiracy theory guy is crazy? Yeah. Yeah, remember him? He's back now. He's back with a vengeance. He was right. The ultimate result was that this murder being proven was actually a springboard to proving a major portion of the conspiracy web. But they didn't have to prove everything anyways, because a small fraction of the conspiracy web was enough to get many, many people the death sentence. They had everything that they needed now to put Clarence in prison for life. So because of the validation of the conspiracy web, following the initial arrest for two counts of homicide, on July 15th of 1996, Clarence Heatley received a 47-count indictment, including 11 counts of murder, multiple counts of conspiracy to traffic narcotics, and more than a few indictments involving past sales of narcotics as well as extortion. By December of 1997, he'd officially received over 125 separate charges, including multiple murders, and I was actually surprised to learn that he was the first ever recipient of the drug, the, the drug kingpin law. Uh, that's got way greater punishments if they can prove that you were selling drugs to, like, high-ranking drug dealers. It's, it's the kingpin law, all right? And, and I never knew this, but they had apparently just been working on this and just passed it. He was the first person to ever hit with it. But not only did they hit him with that, they didn't just hit him with the kingpin law. They also charged him under RICO, which is the Racketeer Influenced and Corrupt Organizations Act, a charge specifically applied to major criminals involved in the highest levels of extortion and money laundering. Needless to say, he pled guilty. Clarence offered full confession and cooperation with the police into his own exploits, giving them in-depth details about his dealings and his commands as a drug lord. The police who interrogated him referred to him as the poster boy for the death penalty, stating that they were disgusted and humiliated to be giving him only a life sentence, when he had been committing such numerous and egregious crimes, dating all the way back to dropping out of school in fourth grade, being sent to juvenile detention at age nine, and a string of state prison sentences beginning in 1970. The plea deal that was offered to Clarence Heatley was made only if John Cuff and Clarence both agreed to the deal, and they would have to accept terms that far exceeded simple life imprisonment. John Cuff actually scared Clarence really badly with this and apparently waited six weeks up to almost the last minute to finally accept the deal. You may notice Anthony Boatwright was not mentioned in the indictments above. That's not a coincidence. Shortly before the arrests finally took place, the rivalry between Cuff and Boatwright had become more intense than ever before. Each of them was pleading for Clarence to murder the other behind their backs, and Clarence himself even seemed uncertain over who he was going to choose as his final lieutenant. Ultimately, a decision was made, and Anthony was told that he would be given his wish, that tonight they would finally be killing John Cuff. So, lead the way down to the basement, Anthony, and turn the music up really loud. Despite the fact that Anthony Boatwright had personally used this very trick to murder many unsuspecting victims, he fell for it, and he was brutally murdered in the same old basement of the apartment building that Clarence owned. This basement would eventually be visited by police officers after the confessions. Luminol was utilized at the scene, which makes blood glow uh, under certain light, of course. And um, the officer stated that almost every single inch of the room was glowing, which indicated the presence of a whole lot of blood. Anthony Boatwright was never prosecuted because he was murdered and disposed of in the same fashion that he had done to countless others. Ultimately, Clarence took the stand to confess. And to the great surprise of the prosecutors, Clarence seemed extremely uncomfortable detailing his crimes in the presence of his mother, saying, come on, man, to the prosecutor, and checking over his shoulder when he needed to confess grisly details of torture or murder. His final sentence was life plus 225 years. And as of today, he serves that time at the Medium Security Federal Correctional Institute of Talladega, Alabama, where I met him. I mean, not only did I meet this dude, but I mean, I, I ate with the guy, I, I joked with him, I laughed with him all the time. Uh, I never saw, I never saw crazy 30-something-year-old Clarence. I never saw, 
life or death situation where my freedom is at stake. I never met that version of him. Um, I met him as a man who has been in prison since I was a small child, who has at least seems to have learned the error of his ways. I mean, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that he should be released because, I mean, some things I feel like are just... He, he lost his chance. Too many lives are ruined. But what I will say is that his personality matches that of someone who now sees that they threw their life away and that it wasn't worth it. Um, but I've talked many times about how I learned in prison that the smallest little mustard seed grain of hope can get humans through anything, right? And this dude is one of the people that I think about whenever I say those words because this guy wakes up every single morning and he puts on his khakis that he used the press iron to make nice and crisp. And at 7.30 in the morning, he's out there. He's an orderly, so he cleans the unit and he sweeps up the unit. And he whistles, and he sings the Chicago blues. And somewhere deep inside that famously cold heart, he truly, truly believes that he's going to get out one day. Something inside of him does not let him truly believe that he's going to die inside the walls of prison. And that's why that man wakes up every day. And he was, when I knew him, I just knew him as a man with a wicked sense of humor. I thought he was very funny. Uh, for a guy who dropped out in fourth grade, he is brilliant. I mean, he is, he is, his, his conversation skill, I mean, it, you can... Of course, now that I've studied this case, I can clearly see that, you know, maybe it's some degree of like psychopathy or something like that. But he was always very funny and friendly to me and just just cynical in a kind of sense of humor that you only really, in my opinion, in the modern day only really comes from uh, being an Internet veteran or something like that. And I'm going to I'm going to close that with the the darkest joke that I ever heard him say so that you can get a little bit of a taste of, you know, what this man's sense of humor was like uh, 30 years in prison after he committed some crimes that were so heinous and so famous that there are documentaries and movies made about it. I went to visitation at the same time as him. Uh, I think I was seeing my mom and he was in there seeing his daughter. Uh, his daughter had dreadlocks and she had a girl with her um, and they were holding hands for a large percentage of the time in there. And uh, for those of you who have been following my channel for a while, you probably already know my mom's married to a woman. Like I'm not casting judgment here, but it was very, very obvious that his daughter was in an openly uh, open lesbian relationship. And when we were walking back to the unit. I was like, Hey, Clarence, hey, man, you got to see your family, huh? And he said, oh, yeah, man, that's my daughter in there. She says she's a lesbian now. I was like, oh, yeah? I mean, hey, you know, that probably took a lot of courage for her to come in here and tell you that, you know? And he goes, oh, no, I wasn't worried about it. I don't care. I mean, you know what I told her? I said, honey, listen, daddy's been locked up for a long time. If you're kissing women now, he needs to see it. Good night, everybody.